In this video tutorial, we're going to be discussing the process that's involved in order to balance a rotating system. Now, to begin with, we're going to look at a 2D system as shown on the screen here. And what we have is we have three masses, A, B, and C, and each of those masses are placed at a different radius. We can see that mass A is a one kilogram mass at 100 millimeter radius. Mass B is 1.5 kilograms at 75 millimeter radius and mass C is 2.5 kilograms on a 90 millimeter radius. We also have some angles there. So we can see mass A is placed on the horizontal, mass B is 45 degrees from mass A, and mass C is actually 210 degrees from the horizontal. We have 45 degrees plus 165 degrees, giving us 210 degrees. So what we're going to determine in this video tutorial is the magnitude and position of a new mass D which is going to be placed at a radius of 45 millimeters. So we don't yet know the magnitude of mass D and we don't yet know its angular position but we know that it's going to be placed on a radius of 45 millimeters. Now we're going to position that mass in such a way that it balances the other three masses in the system. Because we have a number of offset masses here, this system will not rest in static equilibrium. If we were to let go of those masses and they were allowed to pivot around the centre, then the likelihood is this disc would rotate without any external force, and it would settle in a new position. What this means is if we were to spin the disc, then it would spin unevenly, it would accelerate and decelerate because the masses are not evenly distributed. By placing our fourth mass, mass D, and ensuring we have static equilibrium in this system, then we could spin this disc and it would spin evenly without interruption. Okay, so the important thing to note here is if we were to spin this disc, then each of our masses, A, B and C, would experience a centrifugal force, and centrifugal force acts outwards from the circle. So A would experience a centrifugal force in this direction, B in this direction, and C in this direction. And the formula for centrifugal force is F equals m omega squared r. What we're going to be doing is constructing a vector diagram to represent each of these forces, but we can simplify this. Because the rotational speed of the disc would be constant, each of the rotational speeds for A, B and C about the centre are all going to be equal. Therefore, we can cancel out the term omega squared. And so we're actually going to construct a vector diagram for the mass times the radius values for each of those three masses. So we have A, we have B, and we have C. Now, providing we're consistent with our units, we can work in millimetres here, because all we're doing here is producing a vector diagram to determine the equivalent sizes of each of these forces. So A then is going to be 1 times 100, which equals 100. If we were to apply units to that, then we would have kilogram millimetres, but we're going to just leave it as a magnitude for the time being. B then is 1.5 times 75, which equals 112.5. And C is 2.5 times 90, which equals 225. Now we also know the relative directions for each of these vectors. We know that A is on an angle of zero degrees. We know that B is on an angle of 45 degrees. So we'll make a note here at 45 degrees. And we know that C, as we mentioned earlier, is at 210 degrees. Those are all referenced with zero degrees at three o'clock and then the angles are being measured anti-clockwise. And that's the standard convention for bearings and for vectors. So what we're going to do is construct a sketch for the addition of those three vectors. In doing so, we can determine the resultant vector, and then we can determine the equilibrium vector, which is going to be used to balance these other three vectors. We can then use that equilibrium vector to determine the size of our mass D.
Okay, so next we're going to construct a vector diagram to represent these three quantities. And whilst we're not going to produce this to scale, we do want to get it roughly in proportion so we can visualize how each of these vectors are interlinked. So first of all then we have vector A. And vector A has a length of 100. And we know that vector A acts in the horizontal direction like so. Next we have vector B. Vector B is slightly longer and is at an angle of 45 degrees. So we're going to represent vector B like so with a length of 112.5. Now finally we have vector C and vector C we notice is actually twice the length of vector B. It's going to be at an angle of 30 degrees from the horizontal. And again, this doesn't have to be exact, but we have vector C acting somewhere in this direction. And vector C has a length of 225. We can see that the resultant of those three vectors then is going to connect the start to the finish. So the resultant acts in this direction here. However, we're not looking to determine the resultant. We're looking to determine the equilibrium, which actually opposes that direction. And we'll come on to that again in a moment. So the next step for us then is to determine the magnitude of our resultant vector. Now, hopefully you recall that we can determine the magnitude of the resultant or the magnitude of the equilibrium using trigonometry. And the way that we do that is first of all find the sum of the x components of each of the vectors and then find the sum of the y components for each of the vectors. From there we can determine magnitudes and directions. So let's start then by doing the sum of our x components for each of these vectors. We have the first vector, vector a, which has an x component of 100 but it doesn't have a y component. The reason it has an x component of 100 is because it's horizontal, it's pointing from left to right. We then need to find the x component of vector b. Now vector b has a right angle here and our enclosed angle here is 45 degrees. Therefore the x component represented by this line here is going to be 112.5 cos 45. So we have plus 112.5 cos 45. And then we can see that the x component of vector c, the 225 here, first of all we can see it's going to be negative because it goes from right to left, like so. And we can also see that its magnitude is going to be 225 cos 30. Now the reason this angle here is 30 degrees is because if we refer to our diagram, we've already said that the full bearing from here to here is 210 degrees, but the angle for half a circle is 180 degrees. So from here to here is 180. Well, 210 minus 180 gives us 30 degrees for that enclosed angle. So for our x components then, we need to subtract the x component for vector c. So we've got subtract 2, 2, 5, cos of 30. Now when we run that through the calculator, we get a sum of the x components equal to minus 15.31. And that's accurate to two decimal places. We need to repeat for our y components. So we have the sum of the y components equals, well, we can see that vector A doesn't have a y component because it's horizontal. We can see that vector B has a y component here equal to 112.5 sine theta, or sine 45 in this case. So we have 112.5 sine of 45, Note that all of these angles are in degrees, 
but we can see that vector C has a negative y component because it's acting downwards, so we need to subtract 225 sine of that angle, which is 30, giving us a sum of the y components equal to minus 32.95. Now, once again, that's accurate to two decimal places. I'm not putting units on here, but if I were to include units, then as we said earlier, these units would be kilogram millimetres because we've constructed a vector diagram for our masses times our radius. OK, so we can see that we have a resultant vector which has a negative x component and a negative y component, which is what we suggested from our sketch. Let's create a new sketch then in order to determine the magnitude of our resultant vector, which will also be the magnitude of our equilibrium vector, and also the direction of our equilibrium vector. Then finally we can determine the magnitude of mass d. Okay, so the sum of our x components came out to be minus 15.31. So you'll notice that I've drawn that arrow from right to left, which is the negative direction, and the size of that vector is 15.31. You'll also notice that the sum of our y components was negative, so again I've drawn that acting downwards, and it has a magnitude of 32.95. So to determine the magnitude of our resultant, which would be represented on the diagram here, well we can see that the resultant is going to act from top right to bottom left because it connects the start of the first vector to the end of the second vector. Its magnitude then can be found using Pythagoras' theorem, and Pythagoras' theorem states that the square of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the square of the two shorter sides, or in this case r squared equals 15.31 squared plus 32.95 squared. Therefore r equals the square root of 15.31 squared plus 32.95 squared, giving us a magnitude for that vector equal to 36.33 to two decimal places. Now please note that that value there, 36.33, is the value for the mass times the radius. Recall that we constructed a vector diagram for the mass times the radius in millimetres. Well, if we refer to our left-hand side, we've already specified that mass D needs to be placed at 45 millimetres. Well, if we know that the mass times the radius for D equals 36.33, then we know that the mass of D is just 36.33 divided by its respective radius of 45, which is going to give us a mass of magnitude equal to 0 0.81 kilograms. Therefore, we know that mass D is 0 0.81 kilograms. What we don't yet know is its angle, but we can use our triangle here in order to determine this internal angle. The internal angle there can be found using tan to the minus 1 of opposite over adjacent. So let's clear some space and carry out that calculation. So I'm going to call the angle that I'm trying to find theta, and then I can write the following. Theta equals tan to the minus 1 of opposite over adjacent, or in this case we have tan to the minus 1 opposite 32.95 over adjacent 15.31, giving me an angle theta in degrees equal to 65.1 degrees. So that gives us the angle from the horizontal there, but we want to express this as a bearing. In the table at the top there, we expressed each of our other vectors as a bearing, so we're going to express this one as a bearing. Let me just include the equilibrium on the diagram. So our equilibrium is the same magnitude as the resultant, but it acts in the opposite direction.
Well, what we can see here using opposite angles is that this angle here also equals theta. And as all of our force vectors are measured as bearings, we can see that the vector for D is at 65 degrees. What this means then is that our mass D needs to be placed at 65.1 degrees on our disc. Let's refer back to our disc in the top left hand corner. Okay, so from our calculations then, we know that mass D has a magnitude of 0 0.81 kilograms. We know that it's positioned on a radius of 45 millimeters at an angle of 65.1 degrees. Therefore, if we were to add this new mass to the diagram, we know that it would sit somewhere around here. Its radius would be 45 millimeters. Its bearing would be 65.1 degrees. And the magnitude of its mass here would be 0 0.81 kilograms. Adding that mass to the system at that position would statically balance that disc, meaning that when we spin or rotate that disc, it would continue to rotate at a constant speed without any fluctuations in that speed.